Now, if only the camera will change so I don't have to hold it the whole time. Okay, so I guess the camera is just going to hate me for right now, and we're going to do the best that we can. So, I'm making a pen and ink here, which is the wrong side up because I'm epic fail. So the ink I'm using here is ink that I actually made myself and made from walnuts gathered in my general area. Um, it's actually a lot of work to go ahead and gather them and process them into ink and some people only boil theirs for a couple of hours and then bottle it up but um, I actually cook mine for a little over three days and add gum arabic and such to go ahead and make sure that it's artist quality and this is something I've been working on it's uh, in coincidentally some black walnut leaves or a painting thereof and I'm using just straight walnut ink that I made myself. This is actually the very first batch and a bamboo reed pen. Part of the effect on here is created from me putting the uh, walnut ink into a spray bottle and then spraying it onto the watercolor paper and adding a little bit of salt before I go ahead and start and that's how you get the little speckly bits here on the side. It actually, even with the gum arabic in it, it actually sprays really really well and doesn't gum up the uh, spray bottle which I don't have in here right now and I'm not going to get so I won't be showing to you. Uh, sometimes when you start your pen can be a little bit dry and temperamental but it warms up in no time and then you'll have blobs of ink in everywhere. I'm working on darkening this area by um, the right side of the stem because I really want the contrast to make it pop out really nice. And it might look like it's really dark here right now, but I promise you that's going to lighten up pretty good. Um, you have to layer it pretty nicely in order to get it to really come out. It's kind of like working with watercolors, but the result can be really, really, really rewarding and I had it at a terrible angle I'm so sorry um, just to give an example of how dark that this can get when you really go ahead and um, put the love into it here is a painting that I recently finished whoops here we go and this is an oak leaf and walnut painting that I did uh, with the pen and ink also. It's the exact same batch of walnut ink but I spent a couple of days working it so that it got nice and dark in those areas. So It can really get very very dark but I'm not trying to get it this one quite as dark as that one was. Um, so if you wind up working with walnut ink or with pen and ink or watercolor in general, don't worry if when it goes on it looks very, very dark because it's going to lighten up all on its own. I promise you. You'll actually have to uh, work a little bit to get it dark. And now this, this is just traditional walnut ink with um, the gum arabic as I mentioned earlier you can actually make your walnut ink very very dark if you use a um, special artist solution of um, iron and vinegar and then you can make it very very dark but I have not done that here now I'm using right now what's called a um, sort of a wet on dry technique. Sometimes when my pen is running out you could almost consider it dry on dry. Um, this is because when you're working oops, with um, inks and watercolors and the like um, 
and you work on a nice wet canvas, it'll spread out and be very unpredictable. It'll be very beautiful and you'll get some really, really incredible looking results. But you won't have very much control over it and that's not the kind of work that I want when I'm doing um, some detailing on leaves and things like this. And it appears that a thunderstorm has started outside. <laughs> Brilliant! So, um, this, ha this piece so far has about um, four or five hours into it, I think. And that doesn't completely include all the drying time that it's had either. It includes a little bit of the drying time, like when I'm letting things dry just a little bit and then I'm still actively working with those layers. But not. it doesn't include um, when I sit down and just let it dry for a while and then come back to it hours later. Um, sometimes it really is necessary to um, let these dry for a good little while in between the layers, otherwise it'll goop up, a, well not necessarily goop up, but you'll get um, nice big wet bulbs and stuff that can spread out and do things that in this case we don't want it to do right yet. That has its place, getting lots of nice big um, dark areas and pools of ink that take a little while to dry like that has its purpose and actually I'm doing a little dark pool of ink down here right now because I'd really like that corner to darken up nicely but nothing too extreme like we don't want any big fat droplets on the end we just want this nice dark coverage right here dark fat droplets are for later so, touch up these nice little corners That'll make it pop and stand out a lot in the end. It'll look really nice. Notice how some of these areas that I've just gone over have actually already dried some. Some of them it can be nice to go over when they're still about medium wet because it can help add that extra bit of pigmentation without creating a new glaze. And a glaze is when you just add a nice new layer over um, your watercolor or your ink. Um, like, see these areas in here are the, that are darkened with the leaves? That's technically a glazed area. Um, and we, that's nice to use for certain techniques, but not for this. Not yet. Um, if you're wondering what some of this mess over here on the side is, well, one of the ways that I got this leaf on here was I used some fresh leaves and I very carefully <laughs> held them in a rather uh, <coughs> fun position and then did my spraying in order to get an initial silhouette and to keep that nice organic look. Also because I, as I'm using the walnut trees and these walnuts to make the inks, well those walnut leaves happened to come from some fresh walnuts that I had gathered that day and so I wanted to utilize more of the plant and the art itself and I did some spraying and when I went ahead and pulled the leaves off they whoosh, they smeared some of the walnut ink on them on that side of the page. But that's part of the fun of working with things like watercolor and pen and ink. And my angle is terrible again because I can't see. I'm so sorry. Um, but there's always this mystery and these really spontaneous, strange things that can happen when you work with pen and ink and watercolor and it's really fun. It's it's not the sort of thing that you want to worry too much about controlling. You want to worry more about letting it do what makes it happy. Let me see if I can get this to lay down in kind of a better position where you can still see but where I'm not killing my hand. 
Hopefully that'll work for a little bit. I am so, so sorry about the angling. It, I had it all set up beforehand, and then when I was getting my iPad in place, YouTube suddenly changed everything around on me, and yeah, because this is the first time I've ever streamed anything on YouTube. So forgive my fails. So here we go, we'll touch up. Uh, inside of some of these corners here uh oh that's a little fat so when you get a fat line like that that bulb that bulbs up too much you can actually take it and drag it off I didn't really want to connect that line there but it's a little too fat so there we go we've actually fixed that little uh, blob of ink there, which uh, threatened to potentially run over <laughs> out of this. Um, and you can do that again just by spreading it out a little bit. And the ink will gently follow. Which is one of the nice things once your um, bamboo reed pen gets warmed up is it's really easy to lead the ink around the page, especially when you're working on a nice dry page. Now for detailing a leaf, um, kind of like I did at the bottom, I want to use a, a heavier color when I come across on this side. And so I'm going to use the pen when I very first just dipped it in the ink. So that I get a heavier line. And if it gets too heavy, we'll just spread it out a little. We'll make our vein. If you use a more textured watercolor paper, then sometimes the, uh, the texture of the paper will sort of throw your line off of what you thought maybe it should have been, but that can be really good if you use nature work because that can add to the organic irregularity that comes into play. Uh, we'll let this go ahead and come down here to that little blob. We'll enhance that little spot that already fell. And then since it's getting a little too fat there on the bottom, we're just going to tilt the page up and let the ink run back down into the top. And at this point, too, if you want to make sure that the ink remains a little bit better distributed, you can go ahead and fan it or blow on it to dry it just a little bit more before you go ahead and tilt your canvas again. But then about um, the uh, watercolor paper again, this is actually relatively smooth. This is, a, this is a cold press and not a hot press, so it does have some texture, but it's not very highly textured like some of the cold press that I like to work with, which has just an insane amount of texture. So, um, if you really want um, a really smooth page, then I recommend going with a hot press, but at the same time, uh, if you're new to pen and ink or new to watercolors, I don't recommend going with a hot press initially because it can feel much more unforgiving than a cold press, slightly rough sheet can. Uh, mostly because it's an extremely smooth clean sheet and so thereby like the slightest little bit of off um, like if you glaze in properly and things wind up uneven it's a lot more difficult to uh, hide those mistakes at, or happy accidents 
as a part of the picture. Um, whereas with even a lightly textured cold press like this, the texture really adds to the roughness and um, hot press is really there for precision work and that's why it's often used for really really fine illustration um, fine botanical work uh, like very fine botanical illustration that you used to see um, in the scientific community and the natural uh, like the, the early naturalists and stuff like that um, it really lends itself to that kind of precision and also uh, really precise illustration work but for rough more organic pieces um, s stick with cold press alright so notice how this stem is actually starting to darken up rather nicely and it's giving a really nice contrast around the leaves so that they go ahead and pop a little bit better um, out from the background. By the way, if you do hear fans in the background, I apologize. It's really, really, really hot here. <laughs> and I'm at least trying to keep them nice and quiet, but me and the cats have to stay at least a little cool. So... All right, now we're gonna go ahead and pull a little bit more of this ink up into these drier veins. That way it doesn't just bulb up down there too much. There we go. Okay. And now, since some of those wound up a little bit fatter, I'm gonna add in some smaller, thinner, lighter ones. That are a little bit more irregular. And then on this side, I want them to be very light. I don't want them to be too dark. I just want them to barely stand out, kind of like down there. You might wonder why I'm using a pen instead of a brush and there's actually some very good reasons for that and it's not just the control of the pen because you can actually have a rather extreme amount of control over a brush. Um, so it's not so much that as um, the pen behaves differently than the brush and well when you use the pen you can get some nice dark thick areas that you can't get in the same way as the brush you there's just it makes max in a different way than you can achieve with with any other tool and that's one of the reasons why artists have continued to really love and enjoy using the pen for so long. Um, pen and ink is a medium that's lasted for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, so I don't think it's going away anytime soon. And now pen and ink um, drawing does use uh, brushes at times, and you can use whatever brushes make you comfortable. I have been known to use watercolor brushes at times um, in my pen and ink, but mostly these days, if I'm going to use a brush, these are the brushes that I use. You may notice that these are Sumi brushes, and they're really rather nice and very comfortable. And it is this brush which created the glazes inside of the leaves. So. That's where that wash comes from, and that's just from dipping it once into the ink and then just giving it a nice once over. When it's wet like that, if you haven't gotten the entire area filled, you can go back over it um, in those areas and make it all um, one uniform wet area as long as it is wet enough to work. 
um, you can go ahead and make it all as one. But once it starts to dry, if you put even just the slightest stroke over it, then it's a whole new glaze and a whole new layer. going to decorate this top one too. Now I'm not going to actually, in the end, I do not plan to put veins in all of these leaves and that's why I'm actually trying to be rather selective about it and why I haven't worked more veins into them yet as is. Um, you may notice I keep going back to this little dark droplet hair and that's because it's, a, it's still a little bit fat and I want to make sure that it dries properly. Um, but also that it doesn't start to bleed out or overflow. Um, one moment, because I need a drink of something tasty. And by tasty, I mean kombucha, but I'm not going to show you which one because I'm not trying to advertise. Just kombucha. All right. So, let's see. But yeah, so I do not plan to detail all of these leaves just because I think it would be rather nice just to leave some of them silhouetted and to just, you know, let your mind kind of extrapolate. I think it creates a greater interest, though I may go ahead and give one or two of them veins. One in the middle. I'm not, I'm not really sure yet. I haven't decided. I'll decide later. Okay. So. I notice how dry, again, some of this is. I keep touching some of these areas up, but you can see how quickly, when you just use your pen and ink for these nice dark areas, if you just lay down one nice layer over another, it dries relatively well, and it's really easy to go ahead and just keep working your way around the picture. That way you can get the details that you want. If one area is too wet, that's fine, just move on. Uh oh. Whoopsie doo! Okay. Didn't intend for that, but it's a part of the picture now! Alright. There we go. Some nice, happy leaf veins up there. These are tiny leaves and I realize that these look a little bit different from what I've managed to do down there. I don't know why that is. Sometimes that just happens. My brain just does whatever it does and that's just how it does. But then again, some of these smaller leaves that would have just been budding, they would look different and they would have different proportions from leaves that were already fully grown and mature. Anyhow, because leaves in that... Oops, it's getting heavy. Leaves in that underdeveloped stage are still developing the, um, the, f the phi ratio. And so it's like whenever you're watching a plant that's blooming or a plant that's freshly growing, uh, the phi ratio, it takes a little while for the phi ratio to really, t you know, get its place in, um, Sorry, my brain's not working right now. <laughs> I'm totally just talking off the cuff. Um, it takes a little while for the phi ratio to get correct. Like when you watch a plant that blooms, it winds up looking a little uneven and funny at first and smushed, but as it grows, the phi ratio in it comes out and then it has, you know, the natural math mathematical pattern that all things in nature do, including our hands. That being said, it's fine if the leaves up here look a little weird. Anyways, it's always fine if your leaves look weird because it's your act and your leaves can look however the hell you want them to. Alright. And yes, I am left-handed. You may have noticed. Well, at least when it comes to painting and drawing, I am and a few other things because I'm very ambidextrous with some stuff, but not everything. 
I only trained my left hand to draw and paint because it took long enough to get that <laughs> trained as is. So, what can you do? All right. So, I think we're going to go in and touch up these dark spots around the stem for contrast again. There we go. All right. But again, I don't want it to be like that other painting that I showed you a little while ago because this one has a different feel to it. It's I don't try to reproduce the exact feelings and atmospheres of paintings that I've done before. I try to just let my brain and hands do what seems natural with the picture because things always come out better when it's from your hat and you don't force it. But I will show you that one again in a moment, um, just for some technique purposes and just because, because here in a moment I'm going to let this dry a little bit better and that'll give us a moment without being boring. Right. Although I'm sure that somebody in the comments out there will be like, this is boring anyways. You're boring. That's cool. You don't have to think I'm fun. It's all good. There's plenty of cat videos out there. Okay. And... Alright. Okay. So we've got a little blob of ink down here on the bottom. I don't know if you can completely see it or not, but... I'm going to go ahead and just lift it up gently with a little bit of toilet paper. It just pulls it right off and it's not a problem. So there's lots of ways, as you can tell, of dealing with blobs. But you have to get them quick and decide exactly what you want to do with them. Darkening of these contrast areas again. And I'm going to fill this out a little bit here too, just to give it a little bit of a glaze to make that whole corner a little bit darker, a little bit more contrast. When you're working in monochromatic tones, the amount of contrast that you use or don't use really is key. It really means a lot and it will either add a lot to your picture or it will take a lot away because you don't have all the extra colors and stuff to draw the interests of the eye. You're just using monochromatic colors and your design. So it's important to really make good use of your design elements and to make really good use of your tones and contrast. Although, this being said, if you're an amateur artist or a student artist who has a little bit of difficulty working with tones and understanding how to work with tone well, like um, in your color and design class, if you were like, what the hell's wrong with my tones? Um, this type of thing is a really, you know, monochromatic work is really good practice because you get the ability to really explore tones and when you do them using watercolors or pen and ink um, especially pen and ink then it gives you a very different and interesting sense and you can learn a lot because your initial layers will always be lighter 
Now, we could even take this walnut ink lighter by mixing it with just a little bit of water and then we could get some really light, beautiful glazes. And maybe I'll do that in a second and show you, we'll see. Um, you know, but you can lighten it up and do very light glazes, um, very light work and then work your way towards the dark. That's the most important thing is you don't start dark <laughs> with watercolor and pen and ink. In oil color and acrylics, you start dark and you work light. When you're doing pen and ink and watercolor, you start light and you work dark. Okay? It's very important to remember which way you go when you are using your process. Sometimes it can seem like it's the right thing to do to start dark, but when you come into watercolors and stuff, there's just no way to lighten it back up once you stunt once you started. You 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 just can't do it without ruining your paper. You're never going to ever be able to really successfully lighten a watercolor or a pen and ink and something that you should avoid at all costs when using watercolor and pen and ink is white paint. Don't use it. Don't use it. It's, um, it's not considered very professional. It's actually considered very bad form. Um, if you want white when you're working in watercolor or pen and ink, what you need to do is, like I've done here, is you just leave the paper bare. Now, you can do that either by simply not painting the area or you can get um, what's called masking solution, which is almost kind of like a rubber cement, but it's not rubber cement, that you go ahead and you paint onto areas of the canvas and it will create a resist and so you can even paint over it, all around it, and then um, when you're finished painting for the day, you peel it off and it'll leave a nice clean white area. Um, it's very lovely to work with and it can be very very useful especially if you need to keep some very clear specific shapes free for different effects in your watercolors. Um, on this page it's a very messy picture. It's intended to be messy because I want it to be organic and rough and to reflect the organic nature of the materials used. But if I was doing something that was super precise, like again, botanical work, um, like very precise scientific botanical illustration, um, something I refer to because I actually have done it in the past, um, if that's what we were working with or if we were working with um, highly detailed illustration, then masking fluid would be something that would matter. But in a picture like this, I have no need for masking fluid because I'm just trying to enjoy the organic nature of the picture and however it turns out. So that is how you achieve white when working in pen and ink or watercolors is you just don't paint it or you use a masking fluid. And masking fluid is a perfectly normal tool. You can get it at um, just about anywhere, Hobby Lobby, um, any art store. You can probably even pick it up like from Walmart or anywhere else that sells enough art supplies for it to matter, you know. Um, so it is what it is. Um, but it's it's it costs um, probably around, depending on the size and the quality of the bottle, pro plan for about ten dollars on masking fluid, between eight and fifteen if you really want a better uh, range. Um, but it'll last you for a good little while, so it's worth it. Um, yeah. Let's see. I'm trying to think of anything else helpful that I can... Uh... Bamboo reed pens are very easy to come by. They're very cheap. Um, just about any art supply store or art supply catalog would have them. They're only a few bucks, if that. They cost almost nothing, and they're very easy to use. Unlike other um, calligraphy pens and quill nibs and stuff, um, they're very, very easy to use. Uh, I have a couple 
when it comes to certain inks, they don't always seem to work as well for me. This is the one that I like the best. And just to show you, um, I prefer not this end, but this end. You may notice this end has an extra long bevel. And that allows the ink to kind of get into the reservoir and get onto the pen a little bit better. And I have a better time applying it to the pages. So me personally, I prefer a longer bevel. That way it gets into the ink properly. And you may notice that this jar that I'm dipping in is actually like not, I can't dip any longer than the bevel um, anyways and that would be extraneous, and that would be like way too much. So yeah. So just to give a little bit of extra tip on the tip that I'm using. And you may notice that yeah, sometimes I do turn it upside down and then spin it around and that's because the ink is distributed in different areas of the pen and certain areas of the pen can give you slightly finer lines than others and so it's good to move it around like that. It gives you um, better coverage and helps you better really use your ink. That is still a fat little blob. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and use our handy dandy toilet paper to go ahead and clean this little blob here up. Okay, there we go. See, isn't that nice? Problem solved. I'm going to dot this one more time here. That was not a good dot. There we go. Now... Uh-oh. Little one's going to get fat again, but it's okay. Because this needs another glaze because all of those veins are blending into each other. And I want a few of them to stand out. So that means I'm going to have to go over them again to give them the extra pigment. And I have to let them dry and go over them a couple more times before they really get to where they need to be. Speaking of where getting to where it needs to be, this is getting some really beautiful contrast in here now. It's really helping the leaves to pop out of the drawing. Oops, not enough. I waited too long before I put the pen back down. Okay. I'm gonna let that just very, very gently drag that into the point there. Uh oh, it's a little too fat. It's gonna bleed if we don't help it out. There we go. Okay. Just dab it gently. Actually, I'm going to let this turn into a little bit more fine, finely tuned dot there, and this is getting fat again, so we're going to drain off that excess one more time. Yeah, you only just need a little, when you're working like this on the details, you really just need a nice little corner of toilet paper, and it'll pick up most of the problems that you have. That needs to dry more before I'm going to get it to act better. Drag this line down here, make it a little bit fatter just because I want to. Okay. And this is getting a little bit fat here again. those areas are. If I'm not careful, these two areas are going to bleed together. <laughs> and I don't want that. So I need to not mess around with that anymore for right now up there. Just gonna put a couple little touches on this, and then it's gonna be about time for me to go so that I can try and eat some dinner. Alright. Oops. I 
needed more ink than that. Make that line nice and strong. Strengthen this here too. I think I'm going to tip this one here. Darn it. Not enough ink there. I'm going to make sure that I don't stick my hand in that fresh ink down there while I touch this up. Sometimes I don't think when I'm putting my hand down <laughs> and I'm painting. I get too busy and too lost in my work to think about anything else. I'll just go ahead and darken that up. And texture it a little bit there. Oh, that's a little bit fat there. Okay, that's fine. Up there. Okay. So now I'm going to touch up this last little bottom bit right here, I think. It's apparently a nice big fat blob of ink, which that's fine. We're gonna let it drag down here to this bottom bit. Get it a little bit more texture and fun there. There we go. Okay. That helped drag that little fat bit down. And that's just fine. So got this nice and detailed and it's about time for me to go so I'm gonna go ahead and show you that um, finished picture in the same ink real quick again so Again, this is uh, made using oak leaves and salt, and again, it's, I'm not sure if you can tell, but that is a slightly textured cold press watercolor paper, which is part of the texturing that we get in here. This one specifically is actually from a Strathmore um, cold pressed pad. I kind of like Strathmore at, for some things because it's got these neat little lines in it, and the lines give their own neat little special effect, but I also really like Atches. Um, and Fabriano does some really interesting textures as well. Um, I'll be making some handmade paper soon and I'll show that once I do. Um, and we've got some very, very heavy ink layering that happened over a few days on this um, in order to achieve these very, very dark effects um, on these oak leaves that I've painted. And so there's also, I used point, pointillism technique, which is where you sit there and you just dot, 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 dot. I used some hand smearing. The signature's hiding over here. I'll actually go ahead and darken that up later. Um, but yeah, so these are from homemade watercolor inks, which um, I myself made. And... I am really, really, really pleased with the outcome. I uh, seem to have done a good job of making some nice artist grade stuff. And I'm actually making quite a lot of it. And there will be... I'll, I'll let you know if anything more develops out of that later. But... Yeah, I'm trying to get some more videos up soon, but I've just... I've had some stuff going on, and I've just haven't been able to do it between moving and my car breaking and a bunch of other stuff as well as I don't have a place set up in my new apartment for filming 
really, <laughs> right now. And I'm trying to sort some things out in order to go ahead and get that happening again. I'll let you know as soon as I'm able. And thanks, everyone. You are fantastic fans. And I hope that you all have a great day. Take care. Be well. Ciao. Or, if you speak Hindi, for Malenge! <laughs> have a good one, everyone. I know it's been a while, but have a great one. It's been great to see you guys, and I'm so sorry it's been so long. Aren't I messy? It is such a hot day! <laughs>